Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Anaya. Welcome to the Women's Eye Podcast. I am so happy you are joining me today. This is where you will meet fascinating women who are leaving their mark, making a difference, and changing lives. This episode is brought to you by Casco Financial Group in Phoenix, Arizona. In fact, Catherine Scrivano is the president of Casco Financial Group. She started her business to help people create financial strength to achieve their dreams. My guest today is Veronica Aguilar. In addition to serving as the assistant vice president outreach, at Arizona State University. She's also the founder and chair of a new nonprofit organization. It's called Young and Empowered Women. And we'll talk about her journey into higher education. Also, what motivated her to launch a nonprofit at the beginning of a pandemic. So Veronica, it is so nice to see you. Welcome to the Women's Eye Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Well, we have so many mutual connections. I'm so surprised we haven't met before today. <laughs> I know we do. I noticed that as well. I'm sure in some passing we've met, but really nice to have this conversation with you. Well, thank you. You are a proud Arizona native. Don't bump yes. into a lot of natives in Arizona these days. <laughs> and first generation college student. What was your childhood like? Were there challenges or something significant that happened that sparked your desire to become the first to attend college, which is such an accomplishment? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So yeah, being born and raised here in Arizona, um, being a proud native um, and also, you know, a Latina uh, growing up in the community. um, My parents for sure firsthand said that education is the most important thing, right? Nothing can take your education away. You can get a job taken away, a house and whatnot, but your education is something that you're able to carry with you throughout your whole life. So I was raised to uh, believe that and live that out. Um, I cared deeply about it and got incredibly involved, um, which allowed me to attend Arizona State University, which was so incredible. Um, you know, not having much social capital going into the university really pushed me to just go all in, try to get involved as much as possible through Greek organizations within the business school I was a part of and really applying to different scholarships that allowed me to get to that level. Um, During my time there, it was around junior year, actually, the financial crisis hit um, and it impacted many families, of course, um, across the country, right? Um, It impacted my family where, um, you know, I had to make sure that I was able to apply to scholarships to finish out my time at the university. Um, And because I valued education so much, I was able to get about $20,000 in scholarships to finish my time and complete my degree. Um, So that was the moment, honestly, right there when I saw firsthand the inequities within education of how a change of events could impact a family so much. Uh, which is how I actually decided after graduation to join an organization called Teach for America, um, which really focuses on closing the achievement gap for our low income students. Um, And at that time, I knew it was something for me to, you know, stay here in Phoenix, make an impact in my community because of not only my personal experience, but ensuring um, if others had that experience, they'd be able to be set up on a path to make them successful. You know, I can relate so much to your experience. I feel like college was really where I found who yes. I truly am and who I'm supposed to be. And I can't mm-hmm. imagine, you know, anybody not having that opportunity. And you have said that your life mission is to promote equity within education and to blaze the trail for women mm-hmm. leaders. As a former Teach for America Corps member, you taught fourth grade. Yes. <laughs> Amazing grade. <laughs> yes. It's so wonderful. And it's all about creating that opportunity for children to get a quality education, regardless of their zip code. This pandemic, though, it really magnified the educational disparity that exists in this country. So where do we, in your opinion, begin to close that gap, to bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, even before the pandemic, right, we had 16 million children across the country that were living in poverty, and only 8% of them were graduating by the age of 24 at a post-secondary university. Um, And that was before the pandemic, right? We're still collecting data to see the the impact of what has happened in the pandemic for our students and for our learners. Um, And something that I've noticed, and you, you verbalized it so well, the pandemic truly did amplify the gaps that already existed very much in access, right? Not only access to education, but access to technology and resources, especially in our rural areas, right? Um, So for me, really thinking about how we need to adjust, um, it's really creating systemic change. 
Um, of course, we need more teachers in the classroom. We need more incredible educators there every day for our students. Um, but they can only do so much, right? And they cannot be the only solution to this educational inequity that's happening. So we need community leaders, we need business partners, we need po uh, policymakers being a part of this work together. Um, because I always say this, if you can imagine um, every CEO, politician, lawyer, doctor who has taught in a low income community for, for two or three years, imagining the decisions that would be made um, to better our education system. So I think that's why when we think about it, uh, we really need that systemic change, uh, bringing individuals together, convening, having individuals travel to the schools, um, obviously fundraise and, and really increase the value of education here within Arizona, um, not just at a money's level, but also at an institution level. Um, and of course, just the educational brand in itself to really put us on track um, to hopefully move up within the country of rankings. We're a little bit low right now. Um, so I think, like I said, we really need those system change leaders to make an impact in our community. Well, you are so passionate about education, but you're also equally passionate about women. And we also noticed with the pandemic that it drove women out of the workforce in huge numbers. And it was during Absolutely. that time that you launched the nonprofit Young and Empowered Women. It, it's based in Phoenix, but I know you have women members from all over the country. How would you describe the women in that group and how are you empowering them to become those professional leaders and mentors of today? Absolutely, Catherine, thanks for asking about that. Um, you know, half of our labor force uh, includes women, right? But only a third of them are in that manager level. Um, and like I said, this was even before the pandemic and really heading into uh, my final year um, as an MBA graduate at ASU, um, I took a lot of entrepreneur classes, business planning courses, and that was when the pandemic hit. Um, and that was when, for me, I've been a very proud mentor to several rising female leaders throughout my, my career as an educator, working for Teach for America and at ASU. And I, to be honest with you, I started to get phone calls left and right. Veronica, I'm about to lose my job. Veronica, I've been out of work and I need to head back in. I need to go to grad school. And when I had these individual conversations, I knew that I am no way in shape or form the expert in every career field possible. So I needed to bring them together. Um, and so I threw everyone in a Zoom room and wanted to see what happened uh, June of 2020. At that time, we needed someone who is passionate and inspirational to chat with these women and lift them up. So I brought in one of my own mentors, uh, Laura Capello, who's the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters. Here I know in Arizona. Laura. It's wonderful. She's amazing. Yeah. Yes. And so if you need anyone to lift you up in a time where you're you're questioning things, she is that person. Um, and from there, Catherine, um, you know, it really took on in itself very organically. We started with 20 members. We have 50 now. We're filed as a 501c3 nonprofit, and we really work to close that gender gap um, through various ways. So mentorship like mine and Laura, right? Um, through also professional development and one-on-one -on -one coaching opportunities with our board and skill sessions where incredible keynote speakers come in from different industries to really explain not only their story, but how they've navigated through some hot topics, right? Um, overcoming imposter syndrome, negotiating salaries, um, and really being able to support our women in those tough challenges that you may not be able to talk with at the water pool at, at work. So that is where we're at now, which is incredibly exciting. So now that you've gotten these uh, voices, these women voices from all over, mm -hmm. how do you, in your opinion, based on what you're hearing, yes. uh, how do we, I should say, create more economic opportunities for women, especially now with how so much has changed um, as a result of the pandemic? Totally. That's a great question. You know, originally heading into this, we wanted to think of it as we need to give our women leaders the tools and resources to lift and elevate their voices in every industry and field they're in and career. Um, but what's interesting is that we're noticing, you know, we are preparing our women to head into conversations to negotiate their salary or get a promotion or be a manager. But we're noticing that statistically, some of the employers um, that they're working in are not promoting them. Um, they're not granting them the salary increase. They're not giving them these opportunities. So I think now, not only do we need to work together to provide each other the tools and resources to support each other in these um, different career fields, but we also need to make sure that companies and employers are, are walking the walk, right? You know, if they're about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, 
um, you know, let's show it, right? Um, so I think now taking it to the next level of talking to uh, companies across the valley um, and being able to provide them resources to help navigate and support retention for our diverse female workforce so they could rise up, right? Being more accountable, um, taking a look at their own leadership team and ensuring that they are having a great representation, a diverse representation at that um, of their workforce. So I think that's the next level that us at Young and Empowered Women, we're going to be working with more companies as well within the next couple of years. That's fascinating. Looking forward to hearing more about that. And, you know, speaking of uh, achieving more. You also earned your MBA with a 4.0 GPA from ASU. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> also, something you did during a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> How important is, is your role at the university as assistant vice president outreach? What exactly do you do? Yeah, great question. So when I started in the MBA program, um, I'm such a lifelong learner. I knew I needed to uh, go back to ASU to pursue this. Um, I was working um, as an associate director at Career and Professional Development Services, um, providing career resources to our half a million alumni all over the globe. Um, and you can imagine during the pandemic, we were very busy. Um, so an amazing team there. Um, and in my second year, I was able to get promoted to assistant vice president um, as I was finishing up my degree uh, to really put together all my passions that I've had of not just career, but also ensuring that students across Arizona uh, diverse students have the resources to go into post-secondary education, have that option. Um, currently, you know, only half of the population with our high school learners um, even have an op opportunity to go to college. So I think for us and my team, uh, we want to make sure that our students, um, Latinx, Indigenous, um, Black, African American, know the resources to attend and making sure that financial barriers are not an issue, right? Um, and to provide those opportunities and resources. So I have an incredible team working on this, and we're also working with companies as well to ensure that they're providing great internship opportunities also for our learners so they can be successful, um, really showcasing diverse population, especially our Latinx community here in Arizona. Well, and you're able to go out into the community and really talk about this as the first in your family to graduate with both a bachelor's and a master's degree. So what's your advice to young women and rising leaders out there who you come into contact with all the time when it comes to overcoming obstacle or obstacles or, or challenges in achieving their dreams? Yeah, Catherine, that's a great question. I would say um, you know, finding a mentor, someone who will push you and advocate for you, um, have those uncomfortable conversations of how to move you forward to the next level. But I think also just being able to advocate for yourself in those situations and really having your own little mini board of directors, I like to call it, in your corner rooting you on because uh, you and I both know this, not every day are we able to um, have big wins, right? And being able to advocate for ourselves and, and stand our ground, a lot of self-talk happens. So I think just being able to create your own mini board of directors to call on, right? Um, if it's someone that you see that has a professional career that you'd want to have attained in the future, having someone in that nature as well, or even educational opportunities. So really leaning on others and, and being humble and realizing you don't know the answer to everything and that's okay um, because you have a group of women in all these different organizations you me being able to lift each other up truly well and i also have felt in my experience that it was important to surround yourself with some of those people who are not going to be the yes people but the yes people who tell you <laughs> the the raw truth sometimes when you least expect it or don't want to expect it but you can't surround yourself with people who are telling you you're wonderful all the time because that's not going to help elevate you right Yes, that is correct. And it's really good to have that. Um, and I think it, it, it over time, you're able to welcome more of that because, you know, over time you have different goals and goals change too. And I think that's something for us to remember, right? Something that we wanted to be when we grew up. My goodness, that has changed like three different times for me, but that's okay. Cause I have confidence and know that whatever I want to do, I want to make a great impact in the community. And like you said, being able to surround yourself with individuals who also do that but can also call you out on potential mistakes that you may make um, and different pivots that you may need to make as well to grow. Yes, the power of the pivot. So what would you say <laughs> are, what would you say are the top three skills then that you believe are most important for young women professionals and rising leaders to have right now in mm -hmm. 2021? Yes, um, I would say right now a mentor. 
um, could be multiple mentors as well. Um, I would say also resources that you have available to yourself to grow. So if that is gaining higher education, um, learning a new language, um, always invest in yourself in various ways that you would want to and really pulling on the resources that you have in your community. Um, and then also LinkedIn is your friend. Um, outreach to those individuals and female leaders that you may see that are CEOs or someone that you aspire to be, they want to talk to you. Um, and the beauty of Zoom, right? They're able to have conversations with you even if they're across the country. Um, so utilize networking tools like LinkedIn to really grow your network um, also during this time. Well, and I always say, you know, don't, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody you don't know because yes. chances are that person is just waiting for the opportunity to share their experiences, the highs and the lows of how they got to where they are. Absolutely, 100% agree. So what kind of inspiration do you like to see women provide for each other? Mm, yeah, I would have to say something that I'm noticing is that in the workplace um, for individual you know, women trying to grow or advance their career um, is, seeing each other as partners in that work within the company, right? Um, really being able to lean on each other and utilize each other. I really hope that women are, and I don't know if this is happening everywhere, right? But I really hope that women are trying to lift each other up in those meetings, right? In meetings where their opinions are being asked and they're not getting their voice talked over in, right? Um, being able to elevate and lift up direct reports that you may be managing because their success is also your success. And one individual female leader cannot move the needle on this gender gap that's happening. We need to do it together. Um, so that's what I hope that our you know, women are doing to not just inspire themselves to move forward, but inspire each other uh, so we can move the needle a bit more. I love that. I completely agree. It's all about collaboration and really just lifting each other up. So, yes, really eliminating that competition, right? Yes, um, we need to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're in this together. Yes. So how would you like to see yourself and young and empowered women in say the next five years? Oh, yes. I would love for young and empowered women to grow. Like I said, we currently have 50 active members. We're on track to double by next year, which is incredibly exciting, um, especially here in our base in Arizona. Also to collaborate with community partners that share the same mission. I mean, Catherine, I'm like, let's get everyone together, right? Who care about this work and want to do this together across the valley. Um, that's how we can be a collective force with a shared goal. Um, so that's something that I'm hoping to see, not just for our members to meet other incredible female leaders, also grow professionally, but also create this community of movement um, so we can work on our mission together um, and hope to close um, the gender and achievement gap across the valley. I love the way you think. We can accomplish a lot in great numbers. Yes. <laughs> Anika, Absolutely. thank you. I just love your energy. It's so great to chat with you finally. Keep up the wonderful, wonderful work. And thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me here. It was a pleasure. By the way, you can learn more about Veronica and her nonprofit Young and Empowered Women by going to our website, thewomenseye.com. I also want to let you know that The Women's Eye has two books. The first is called 20 Women Changemakers. You can shop for it wherever you buy books and at changemakersbook.com. And our newest book, 20 Women Storytellers, is out right now. And you can find out more about that at womenstorytellersbook.com. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Women's Eye Podcast. Thank you again to my guest, Veronica Aguilar. And thank you so much for joining me. I'm Catherine Anaya. Until next time, remember, it's the world as we see it.